Book 18. The fight went on like wildfire burning. Antilochus, running hard like a herald, found Achilles close to his upswept halls, his great heart brooding with premonitions of what had indeed already happened. This looks bad. All these Greeks with their hair in the wind, stampeding off the plain and back to the ships. God forbid that what my mother told me has now come true, that while I'm still alive, Trojan hands would steal the sunlight from the best of all the Myrmidons. Patroclus, Minotius's brave son, is dead. Damn him! I told him only to repel the enemy fire from our ships, and not to take Hector in a fight. Antilochus was in tears when he reached him and delivered his unendurable message. Son of wise Peleus, this is painful news for you to hear, and I wish it were not true. Patroclus is down, and they are fighting for his naked corpse. Hector has the armor. A mist of black Greek enveloped Achilles. He scooped up fistfuls of sunburnt dust and poured it on his head, fouling his beautiful face. Black ash grimed his fine spun cloak as he stretched his huge body out in the dust and lay there, tearing out his hair with his hands. The women, whom Achilles and Patroclus had taken in raids, ran shrieking out of the tent to be with Achilles, and they beat their breasts until their knees gave out beneath them. Antilochus, sobbing himself, stayed with Achilles and held his hands. He was groaning from the depths of his soul for fear he would lay open his own throat with steel. The sound of Achilles' grief stung the air. Down in the water, his mother heard him, sitting in the sea depths beside her old father, and she began to wail, and the saltwater women gathered round her, all the deep-sea nereids, Glauci and Thalia and Simidosi, Nessia and Speo, Thoe and ox-eyed Haley, Melite and Aera, Amphithele and Agoli, Doris, Panope and milk-white Galatia, Nemertes, Absiudis and Kalyanasa, Clymene, Ianera, Ianasa and Mera, Orithia and Amethea, hair streaming behind her, and all the other deep-sea nereids. They filled the silver, shimmering cave, and they all beat their breasts. Thetis led the lament. Hear me, sisters, hear the pain in my heart. I gave birth to a son, and that is my sorrow, my perfect son, the best of heroes. He grew like a sapling, and I nursed him, as I would a plant on the hill in my garden, and I sent him to Ilion on a sailing ship to fight the Trojans, and now I will never welcome him home again to Peleus's house. As long as he lives and sees the sunlight, he will be in pain, and I cannot help him. But I'll go now to see and hear my dear son, since he is suffering while he waits out the war. She left the cave, and they went with her, weeping, and around them a wave broke through the sea, and they came to Troy. They emerged on the beach where the Myrmidon ships formed an encampment around Achilles. He was groaning deeply, and his mother stood next to him and held her son's head. Her lamentation hung sharp in the air. And then she spoke in low, sorrowful tones. Child, why are you crying? What pain has come to your heart? Speak, don't hide it. Zeus has granted your prayer. The Greeks have all been beaten back to their ships and suffered horribly. They can't do without you. Achilles answered her. Mother, Zeus may have done all this for me, but how can I rejoice? My friend is dead, Patroclus, my dearest friend of all. I loved him, and I killed him. And the armor, Hector cut him down and took off his body, the heavy, splendid armor, beautiful to see, that the gods gave to Peleus as a gift on the day they put you to bed with a mortal. You should have stayed with the saltwater women, and Peleus should have married a mortal. But now it was also you would suffer pain for your ravaged son, you will never again welcome me home, since I no longer have the will to remain alive among men, not unless Hector loses his life on the point of my spear and pays for despoiling Minotius's son. And Thetis in tears said to him, I won't have you with me for long, my child, if you say such things. Hector's death means yours. From under a great weight, Achilles answered, then let me die now. I was no help to him when he was killed out there. He died far from home, and he needed me to protect him.
But now, since I'm not going home and wasn't a light for Patroclus or any of the rest of my friends who've been beaten by Hector, but just squatted by my ships, a dead weight on the earth, I stand alone in the whole Greek army when it comes to war, though some do speak better. I wish all strife could stop among gods and among men, and anger too. It sends sensible men into fits of temper. It drips down our throats, sweeter than honey, and mushrooms up in our bellies like smoke. Yes, the warlord Agamemnon angered me, but we'll let that be, no matter how it hurts, and conquer our pride because we must. But I'm going now to find the man who destroyed my beloved, Hector. As for my own fate, I'll accept it whenever it pleases Zeus and the other immortal gods to send it, and the other, not even Heracles could escape his doom. He was dearest of all to Lord Zeus, but fate and Hera's hard anger destroyed him. It is true that I have a fate like his, and I too will lie down in death. But now to win glory and make some Trojan women, woman or deep-breasted Dardanian matron wipe the tears from her soft cheeks, Make her sob and groan. Let them feel how long I've been out of the war. Don't try out of love to stop me. I won't listen. And Thetis, her feet silver on the sand. Yes, child, it's not wrong to save your friends when they are beaten to the brink of death. But your beautiful armor is in the hands of the Trojans, the mirrored bronze. Hector himself has it on his shoulders. He glories in it. Not for long, though. I see his death is near. But you... Don't dive into the red dust of war until with your own eyes you see me returning. Tomorrow I will come with the rising sun, bearing beautiful armor from Lord Hephaestus. Thetis spoke, turned away from her son, and said to her saltwater sisters, Sink now into the sea's wide lap and go down to our old father's house and tell him all this. I am on my way up to Olympus to visit Hephaestus, the glorious smith to see if, for my sake, he will give my son glorious armor. As she spoke, they dove into the waves, and the silver-footed goddess was gone off to Olympus to fetch arms for her child. And while her feet carried her off to Olympus, Hector yelled, a yell so blood-curdling and loud it stampeded the Greeks all the way back to their ships beached on the Hellespont's shore. They could not pull the body of Patroclus out of javelin range, and soon Hector, with his horses and men, stood over it again. Three times Priam's resplendent son took hold of the corpse's heel and tried to drag it off, bawling commands to his men. Three times the two Ajaxes put their heads down, charged and beaten back. Unshaken, Hector sidestepped, cut ahead, or held his ground with a shout, but never yielded an inch. It was like shepherds against a starving lion, helpless to beat it back from a carcass. The two Ajaxes, unable to rout the son of Priam from Patroclus's corpse. And Hector would have, to his eternal glory, dragged the body off, had not Iris stormed down from Olympus with a message for Achilles, unbeknownst to Zeus and the other gods. Hera had sent her, and this was her message. Rise, son of Peleus, most formidable of men. Rescue Patroclus, for whom a terrible battle is pitched by the ships, men killing each other, some fighting to save the dead man's body, the Trojans trying to drag it back to Windy Ilion. Hector's mind already is bent on this. He means to impale the head on Troy's palisade after he strips off its skin. And you must lie there? Think of Patroclus becoming a ragbone for dogs. Shame to your dying day if his corpse is defiled. The shining sprinter answered her. Iris, which god sent you here? And Iris, whose feet are wind, responded. None other than Hera, Zeus's glorious wife, but Zeus on high does not know this, nor do any of the immortals on snow-capped Olympus. And Achilles, the great runner, how can I go to war? They have my armor, and my mother told me not to arm myself until with my own eyes I see her come back with fine weapons from Hephaestus. I don't know any other armor that would fit, unless maybe the shield of Telamonian Ajax, but he's out there in the front ranks, I hope, fighting with his spear over Patroclus dead. Windfoot, Iris responded, We know very well that they have your armor. Just go to the trench and let the Trojans see you. One look will be enough. The Trojans will back off out of fear of you, and this will give the Greeks some breathing space, what little there is in war. Iris spoke and was gone, and Achilles, whom the gods loved, rose. Around his mighty shoulders, Athena threw her tasseled aegis, and the shining goddess haloed his head with a golden shroud that shot flames from its incandescent glow. 
smoke rising from the pure upper air from a besieged city on a distant island. Its soldiers have fought hard all day, but at sunset the light innumerable they light innumerable fires so that their neighbors in other cities might see the glare reflect off the sky and sail to their help as allies in war. So too the radiance that flared from Achilles' head and up to the sky. He went to the trench away from the wall and the other Greeks out of respect for his mother's tense command. Standing there, he yelled, and behind him, Pallas Athena amplified his voice, and shock waves reverberated through the Trojan ranks. You have heard the piercing sound of horns when squadrons come to destroy a city. The Greek's voice was like that, speaking bronze that made each Trojan heart wince with pain, and the combed horses shied from the chariots, eyes wide with fear, and their drivers went numb when they saw the fire above Achilles' head, burned into the sky by the gray-eyed one. Three times Achilles shouted from the trench. Three times the Trojans and their confederates staggered and reeled, twelve of their best lost in the crush of chariots and spears. But the Greeks were glad to pull Patroclus's body out of range and placed it on a litter. His comrades gathered around weeping, and with them Achilles, shedding hot tears when he saw his loyal friend stretched out on the litter, cut with sharp bronze. He had sent him off to war with horses and chariot, but he never welcomed him back home again. And now the ox-eyed Lady Hera sent the tireless, reluctant sun under the horizon into ocean streams, its last rays touching the departing Greeks with gold. It had been a day of brutal warfare. After the Trojans withdrew from battle, they hitched their horses from the chariots and held an assembly before thinking of supper. They remained on their feet, too agitated to sit, terrified, in fact, that Achilles, after a long absence, was back. Polydamus was the first to speak, prudent, son of Panthous, the only Trojan who looked both ahead and behind. This man was born the same night as Hector, and was his comrade, as good with words as Hector was with a spear. He had the best interests at heart when he spoke. Take a good look around, my friends. My advice is to return to the city and not wait for daylight on the plain by the ships. We are far from our wall. As long as this man raged against Agamemnon, the Greeks were easier to fight against. I, too, was glad when I spent the night by the ships, hoping we would capture their upswept hulls. That hope has given way to a terrible fear of Peleus' swift son. He is a violent man, and will not be content to fight on the plain where Greeks and Trojans engage in combat. It is for our city he will fight, and our wives. We must go back. Trust me, this is how it will be. Night is holding him back now, immortal night, but if he finds us here tomorrow, when he comes out in his armor in daylight, then you will know what Achilles is, and you will be glad to be back in sacred Ilium. If you make it back and are not one of the many Trojans the dogs and vultures will feast upon, I hope I'm not within earshot. But if we trust my words as much as it may gall, we will camp tonight in the marketplace where the city is protected by its towers, walls, and high gates, closed with vaulted, polished doors. At dawn, we take our positions on the wall in full armor, and so much the worse for him if he wants to come out from the ships and fight us for our wall. He will go back to the ships after he has done enough of parading his high-necked prancers in front of the city. He will not have the will to force his way in. Dogs will eat him before he takes our town. And Hector, glaring at him under his helmet. Polydamus, I don't like this talk about a retreat and holing up in the city. Aren't you sick of being penned inside our walls? People everywhere used to talk about how rich Priam's city was, all the gold, all the bronze. Now the great houses are empty, their heirlooms sold away to Phrygia, to Maonia, since Zeus has turned wrathful. But now, when the great god, son of Cronus, has vouchsafed me the glory of hemming the Greeks in beside the city, now is no time for you to talk like a fool. Not a Trojan here will listen. I won't let them. Now hear this. All troops will mess tonight with guards posted and on general alert. If any of you are worried about your effects, you can hand them over for distribution. Better our men should have them than the Greeks. At first light, we strap on our armor and start fighting hard by the ships. If Achilles really has risen up again and wants to come out, he'll find it tough going, for I will be there. 
I, for one, am not retreating. Maybe he'll win. Maybe I will. The war god doesn't care which one he kills. Thus Hector. And the Trojans cheered. The fools, their wits dulled by Pallas Athena. Hector's poor counsel won all the applause, and not a man praised Polydamus's good sense. Then the troops started supper. But the Greeks mourned Patroclus the whole night through. Achilles began the incessant lamentation, laying his man-slaying hands on Patroclus's chest, and groaning over and over like a bearded lion, whose cub some deer hunter has smuggled out of the dense woods. When the lion returns, it tracks the human from valley to valley, growling low the whole time. Sometimes it finds him. Achilles' deep voice sounded among the myrmidons. It was all for nothing what I said that day when I tried to hearten the hero, Menotius, telling him I would bring his glorious son home to Apollos with his share of the spoils after I had sacked Ilium. Zeus does not fulfill a man's every thought. We, too, are fated to redden the selfsame earth with our blood right here in Troy, I will never return home to be welcomed by my old father Peleus or Thetis, my mother. The earth here will hold me. And since I will pass under the earth after you, Patroclus, I will not bury you until I have brought here the armor and head of Hector, who killed you, great soul. And I will cut the throats of twelve Trojan princes before your pyre in my wrath. Until then, you will lie here beside our upswept hulls just as you are. And round about you, deep-bosomed Trojan and Dardanian women will lament you day and night, weeping. Women, we won with blood, sweat, and tears. Women, we cut through rich cities to get. With that, he ordered his companions to put a great cauldron on the fire so they could wash the gore from Patroclus's body without further delay. They put a cauldron used for heating baths over a blazing fire and poured in the water. Then stoked the fire with extra wood. The flames licked the cauldron's belly, and the water grew warm. When it was boiling in the glowing bronze, they washed the body, anointed it with rich olive oil, and filled the wounds with a seasoned ointment. Then they laid him on his bed, covered him from head to foot with soft linen cloth, and spread a white mantle above it. Then the whole night through the Myrmidons stood with Achilles, mourning Patroclus. Zeus said to Hera, his wife and sister, so you've had your way, my ox-eyed lady. You have roused Achilles, swift of foot. Truly, the long-haired Greeks must be from your womb. And the ox-eyed lady replied, Awesome son of Cronus, what a thing to say. Even a mortal man without my wisdom will succeed in his efforts for another man. How then was I, the highest of goddesses, both by my own birth and by marriage to you, the lord and ruler of all the immortals, not to cobble up evil for Troy in my wrath? While they spoke to each other this way, Thetis, silver feet, took her to Hephaestus's house, a mansion the lame god had built himself out of starlight and bronze, and beyond all time. She found him at his bellows, glazed with sweat, as he hurried to complete his latest project. Twenty cauldrons on tripods to line his hall, with golden wheels at the base of each tripod, so they could move by themselves to the god's parties and return to his house, a wonder to see. They were almost done. The intricate handles still had to be attached. He was getting these ready, forging the rivets with inspired artistry, when the silver-footed goddess came up to him, and Cheris, Hephaestus' wife, lovely in her shimmering veil, saw her, and running up, she clasped her hand and said to her, My dear Thetis, so brave in your long robe, what brings you here now? You almost never visit. Do come inside so I can offer you something. And the shining goddess led her along and had her sit down in a graceful silver-studded chair with a footstool. Then she called to Hephaestus and said, Hephaestus, come here. Thetis needs you for something. And the renowned smith called back, Thetis? Then the dread goddess I revere is inside. She saved me when I lay suffering from my long fall after my shameless mother threw me out, wanting to hide my infirmity. And I really would have suffered had not Themis and Uranomi, a daughter of Ocean Stream, taken me into their bosom. I stayed with them nine years, forging all kinds of jewelry, brooches and bracelets and necklaces and pins in their hollow cave, while the ocean's tide, murmuring with foam, flowed endlessly around. No one knew I was there, neither god nor mortal, except my rescuers, Uranomi and Thetis. Now the goddess has come to our house. I owe her my life, and would repay her in full. Set out our finest for her, Cheris, while I put away my bellows and tools. 
He spoke and raised his panting bulk up from his anvil, limping along quickly on his spindly shanks. He set the bellows away from the fire, gathered up the tools he had been using, and put them away in a silver chest. Then he took a sponge and wiped his face and hands, his thick neck, and his shaggy chest. He put on a tunic, grabbed a stout staff, and as he went out, limping, attendants rushed up to support him. Attendants made of gold, who looked like real girls, with a mind within, and a voice, and strength, and knowledge of crafts from the immortal gods. These busily moved to support their lord, and he came hobbling up to where Thetis was, sat himself down on a polished chair, and clasping her hand, he said, My dear Thetis, so brave in your long robe, what brings you here now? You almost never visit. Tell me what you have in mind, and I will do it, if it is anything that is at all possible to do. And Thetis, shedding tears as she spoke, Hephaestus, is there a goddess on Olympus who has suffered as I have? Zeus, son of Cronus, has given me suffering beyond all the others. Of all the salt water women, he singled me out to be subject to a man, Achaeus' son Peleus. I endured a man's bed much against my will. He lies in his halls, forespent with old age, but I have other griefs now. He gave me a son to bear and to rear the finest of heroes. He grew like a sapling, and I nursed him as I would nurse a plant in my hillside garden. And I sent him to Ilion on a sailing ship to fight the Trojans. And now I will never welcome him home again to Peleus' house. As long as he lives and sees the sunlight, he will be in pain, and I cannot help him. The girl that the army chose as his prize, Lord Agamemnon, took out of his arms. He was wasting his heart out of grief for her. And now the Trojans have penned the Greeks in their beachhead camp, and the Argive elders have petitioned him with a long list of gifts. He refused to beat off the enemy himself, but he let Patroclus wear his armor and sent him into battle with many men. All day long they fought by the same gates and would have sacked that city that very day, but after Minotius' valiant son had done much harm, Apollo killed him in the front ranks and gave Hector the glory. So I have come to your knees to see if you will give my son, doomed to die young, a shield and helmet, a fine set of greaves, and a corslet too. His old armor was lost when the Trojans killed his faithful companion, and now he lies on the ground in anguish. And the renowned smith answered her, Take heart, Thetis, and do not be distressed. I only regret I do not have the power to hide your son from death when it comes. But armor he will have, forged to a wonder, and its terrible beauty will be a marvel to men. Hephaestus left her there and went to his bellows, turned them toward the fire, and ordered them to work. And the bellows, all twenty, blew on the crucibles, blasting out waves of heat in whatever direction Hephaestus wanted as he hustled here and there around his forge and the work progressed. He cast durable bronze into the fire and tin, precious gold and silver. Then he positioned his enormous anvil up on its block and grasped his mighty hammer in one hand and in the other his tongs. He made a shield first, heavy and huge, every inch of it intricately designed. He threw a triple rim around it, glittering like lightning, and he made the strap silver. The shield itself was five layers thick, and he crafted its surface with all of his genius. On it he made the earth, the sky, the sea, the unwearied sun, and the moon near full, and all the signs of the garland sky, that garland the sky, Pleiades, Hyades, mighty Orion, and the bear they also call the wagon, which pivots in place and looks back at Orion, and alone is aloof from the wash of ocean. On it he made two cities, peopled and beautiful, Wedding in one, festivals, brides, led from the rooms by torchlight, up through the town, bridal song rising, young men reeling in dance, to the tune of lyres and flutes, and the women standing in their doorways admiring them. There was a crowd in the marketplace and a quarrel rising between two men over blood money for a murder, one claiming the right to make restitution the other refusing to accept any terms. They were heading for an arbitrator, and the people were shouting, taking sighs, and heralds restrained them. The elders sat on polished stone seats in the sacred circle and held in their hands the staves of heralds. The pair rushed up and pleaded their cases, 
and between them lay two ingots of gold for whoever spoke straightest in judgment. Around the other city, two armies of glittering soldiery were encamped. Their leaders were at odds. Should they move for the kill or settle for a division of all the lovely wealth the citadel held fast? The citizens wouldn't surrender and armed for an ambush. Their wives and little children were stationed on the wall and with the old men held it against attack. The citizens moved out, led by Ares and Pallas Athena, both of them gold and their clothing is gold, beautiful and larger than life in their armor, as befits gods in their glory. And all the people were smaller. They came to a position perfect for an ambush, a spot on the river where stock came to water, and took their places, concealed by fiery bronze. Farther up, they had two lookouts posted, waiting to sight shambling cattle and sheep, which soon came along, trailed by two herdsmen, playing their panpipes, completely unsuspecting. When the townsmen lying in ambush saw this, they ran up, cut off the herds of cattle and fleecy silver sheep, and killed the two herdsmen. When the army, city, and council got wind of the ruckus with the cattle, they mounted their high stepping horses and galloped to the scene. They took their stand and fought along the river banks, throwing bronze tipped javelins against each other. Among them were Hate and Din and the Angel of Death, holding a man just wounded, another unwounded and dragging one by his heels from the fray, and the cloak on her shoulders was red with human blood. They swayed in battle and fought like living men, and each side salvaged the bodies of their dead. On it he put a soft field, rich farmland, wide and thrice tilled, with many plowmen driving their teams up and down rows whenever they came to the end of the field, and turned a man would run up and hand them a cup of sweet wine. Then they turned again, back up the furrow, pushed on through deep soil to reach the other end. The field was black behind them, just as if plowed, and yet it was gold, all gold, forged to a wonder. On it he put land, sectioned off for a king, where reapers with sharp sickles were working. Cut grain lay deep where it fell in the furrow, and binders made sheaves bound with straw bands, Three sheaf binders stood by, and behind them children gathered up armfuls and kept passing them on. The king stood in silence near the line of reapers, holding his staff, and his heart was happy. Under an oak tree, nearby heralds were busy preparing a feast from an ox they had slaughtered in sacrifice, and women were sprinkling it with abundant white barley for the reaper's dinner. On it he put a vineyard loaded with grapes, beautiful and gold. The clusters were dark, and the vines were set everywhere on silver poles. Around he inlaid a blue enamel ditch and a fence of tin. A solitary path led to it, and vintagers filed along it to harvest the grapes. Girls, all grown up, and light-hearted boys, carried the honey-sweet fruit in wicker baskets. Among them a boy picked out on a lyre a beguiling tune, and sang the lino song in a low, light voice, and the harvesters skipped in time and shouted the refrain. On it he made a herd of straight-horned cattle. The cows were wrought of gold and tin, and rushed out mooing from the farmyard, going to a pasture by the banks of a roaring river, making their way through swaying reeds. Four golden herdsmen tended the cattle, and nine nimble dogs followed along. Two terrifying lions at the front of the herd were pulling down an ox, its long bellows alerted the dogs and the lads who were running on up, for the two lions had ripped the bull's hide apart and were gulping down the guts in black blood. The shepherds kept trying to set on the dogs, but they shied away from biting the lions and stood there barking just out of harm's way. On it the renowned lame god made a pasture in a lovely valley, wide with silvery sheep in it, and stables, roofed huts, and stone animal pens. On it the renowned lame god embellished a dancing ground, like the one Daedalus made for wing-witted Ariadne in wide gnosis. Young men and girls in the prime of their beauty were dancing there, hands clasped around wrists. The girls wore delicate linens, and the men fine spun tunics glistening softly with oil. Flowers crowned the girls' heads, and the men had golden knives hung from silver straps. They ran on feet that knew how to run with the greatest ease, like a potter's wheel. When he stopped to cup it in the palm of his hands and gives it a spin to see how it runs, 
Then they would run in lines that weaved in and out. A large crowd stood around the beguiling dance, enjoying themselves, and two acrobats somersaulted among them on cue to the music. On it, he put the great strength of the river ocean lapping the outermost rim of the massive shield. And when he had wrought the shield, huge and heavy, he made a breastplate gleaming brighter than fire, and a durable helmet that fit close at the temple, lovely and intricate, and crested with gold. And he wrought leg armor out of pliant tin. And when the renowned lame god had finished this gear, he sat down before Achilles' mother, and she took off like a hawk from snow-capped Olympus, carrying armor through the sky like summer lightning.